Well, good morning, Grace Church. Hopefully, I trust you all had a great Christmas time, right? Did everybody have family out and enjoy the friends and family that came over and the, the food, right? It was probably excellent, way too much. Um, but it's really a blessing to be able to spend time together and uh, with family, right? My son came up this time from South Carolina, and we dispelled two myths that he carried with him all the time about Chicago. One of them was that every time he came up for Christmas, uh, it snowed, and there wasn't any this time. I mean, he stood around and he said, I don't know what to think about this. But his second myth that he, we dispelled was the fact that every time he comes up here, he always says the same thing. It's a gray day in Chicago. And uh, you know very well during this time of the year, you know, we get a lot of gray days. And uh, guess what happened this time? The sun came out a few times, and I think it shocked him. So um, we really enjoyed having him. I trust that you've had a very wonderful Christmas and are looking forward to a brand new year in which to serve the Lord. Um, here we are, you know, today we're one day off of celebrating a new beginning, right? A new year, 2019. And I trust that your 2018 went very well this year. I know sometimes we all sit down and try to take stock of what happened. I'll just be honest with you, I failed many times. I had some successes. But you know, that's what God's all about, isn't it? He gives us the space to fail. He gives us the space to succeed. And hopefully in the middle of it all, we learn something, we learn how to walk with him. And so uh, what I like to do today is um, I like to jump off and start out in James chapter 4, if you want to turn your Bibles over there. And uh, I'd like to leave with you uh, three thoughts about 2019. Uh, I'm not really good about Christmas or New Year's resolutions. Anybody here really good about those things? So I just ignore them. But what I want to do is I want to kind of give you three thoughts that maybe might help you navigate uh, this new year and uh, actually be a blessing to those around you and to yourself. And so we're going to jump off into James chapter 4, 13 through 17. This is God's word. It says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a place and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And let's pray as we get started, okay? Father, we love you and just thank you for a time. As a church, Lord, we can once again remember your grace, your goodness, and what you've done on our behalf, Lord, that we don't deserve. And Lord, we stand before you, all of us do, and admit, Lord, that we forget, choose our own way, and Lord, actually make decisions that are not very pleasing to you. But Lord, you're in grace, you are committed to bringing us to the end of our journey here as a wonderful offering and a praise to God. And so Lord, we just pray that as we think about three thoughts, Lord, help us to uh, consider ourselves in these thoughts and uh, what we might do to please you this year. And we pray this in your name and all God's people said, amen. Well, I think the one thing that stands out in that passage is, is that our life is like a mist. And it's here for a little time. That's God's opinion. Uh, obviously, he's looking at us through eternity. We kind of show up as a mist. I wish, we'd say, I wish he'd say we show up like a flower. And we'd be here a little while. But in his, in his opinion, and as he looks out over eternity, we are here for just a brief time. And uh, I know in my own life, uh, this year went by much faster than last year. Anybody feel that way? It just like zoomed by. You know, I really try hard to hold on to the summertime. I say, I want to make summer go slow so I can enjoy it. And guess what happened? Summer raced by again. And so I really do get this thing about being a mist. And so, um, so what I like to do today is I like to just share three thoughts with you. And uh, how I like to frame that out is, is to take a look at our lives and think of about it as a journey that we're trying to journey through here together um, serving the Lord. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our future first. And the thought I'd like to bring up about our future is this idea of destiny. Destiny. Destiny is defined as our future or preordained path of life. It's a powerful compass, by the way, that, uh, um, that uh, points to how our future will turn out. You might say it would be the trajectory of our life. And so trajectory, so destiny is a pretty important thing because we, if we keep it in front of us, hopefully we will, go, we will be steered in the right direction and we'll do the right things. And, uh, and when I think of destiny, you know, as an Awana missionary, this is what I think about in destiny, and I know if Ken and Denise can probably agree with this. When we talk about life threads uh, for Awana to churches all the time, one of the areas that we talk about for junior high kids is this idea of destiny, don't we? And, uh, and there's always a verse that's tied to that. I think most people have this as their verse when it comes to understanding destiny. But it's found in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And, and this is what it says. It says this. It says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Now, there's some big words in there that I think are important. Okay, One of those words is plans. Uh, God, and when, you, when you place this uh, scripture in context of what's going on, this is Jeremiah speaking to a group of exiles, uh, refugees, uh, because Israel wasn't faithful that had been scattered over across the time. And in the middle of, their, in the middle of being these exiles, you know, he wanted to give them hope. And the hope he said was, is, look it, he says, I have a plan for you, and I have a future and a hope for you. And that was to provide some hope for them as they, as they point their direction forward in their lives. Now, does, now, let me ask this question. Does God have a destiny for us? What do you think? Okay, so what is God's plans for us, if I might ask? What do you think? Uh, I heard that. Uh, can you say it just a little bit louder? Tell others about Jesus, okay. What else would be a plan that he has for us? Okay, so, so the plan he has for us is the gospel, right? That's the plan he has for us. He, he, he desires us to place our faith and trust in what his son Jesus has done on the cross for us, for our sin. That's his plan for us. And I think all of us know a great verse, and it's always good to rehearse this verse. I love this verse. It's probably the most famous verse that kids quote together, and that's John 3, 16. So let's all say that together, okay? Because that's just an amazing confirmation of his plan. And here we go. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. Great reminder of his plan for us. But, but what, if, what is the future and the hope that God has for us? I heard that. Heaven. Yes, heaven. Uh, the future and hope God provides for us is an eternalist, e endless eternity of complete peace and harmony lived in the presence of the forever glory and grace of the triune God. Amen. That's, that's, that's his hope and a future for us. So he has a plan for us, and he has a hope and a future for us. And, we, and he hopes that we will place him at the center of our destiny. But unfortunately, many of us kind of set our own destiny sometimes, don't we? Um, our plans and our hopes are based on things that this fallen world offers. Um, and as a matter of fact... Um, our future would be one of disappointment. You know, if we hang on to that, it would be one of disappointment both here and when we stand before God. You know how I know this is true? Because there's a lot of, you know, I work with kids. Uh, we're in kids' ministry, and, and we've noticed a shift and a change in the way parents view their kids sometimes. And honestly, I think some parents think the destiny of their children is sports. And what happens is when you have a destiny out there, your destiny tends to lead your motivations and tends to drive what you do. That's why it's important that our destinies focus vertically on who? Jesus Christ, right? 
Because if it's focused on Jesus, our motivations will all fall into place as we move forward on him, not on the things of this fallen world. As a matter of fact, what's going to happen is there's going to be believers that are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day, and they're going to have to give account. We're all going to have to give account of what we've done. And in many times, guess what? We're still sinners. We still forget Christ. We still, we still want to do our own thing, and many times we're going to have to confess the fact that our intentions were not on Christ like they should be. They were on something else. And if you're a believer, if you're an unbeliever, in other words, you never placed your faith and trust in Christ, there will be a time of reckoning because you didn't choose God's destiny for you where you're going to stand before the white throne of God and face his judgment. And they're going to open the, the books of life and they're going to take a look in the books. And if your name is written there, that's, you know, you'll probably be in heaven. But they're going to check the books. And because at the white throne, those people, their names aren't written in the books of life. Guess what happens? They go into the lake of fire, which never designed for man. It was not God's destiny for us to be there. It was our destiny to be in heaven with him uh, with a hope and a future. Amen? And so destiny, destiny is just one of those great things that's important to remember uh, as we approach 2019. Allowing God to set our destiny plays a huge role in demonstrating to those we love that we trust in someone or something bigger than ourselves. That's the role that destiny plays in our life. And so, uh, has everybody got a good destiny picked out? It is the trajectory of our life. But then there's a second thing I'd like us to think on, um, not only our future, but let's go to our past a little bit. What's been done in the past? By the way, what's been done in the past is in the past, amen? That's, that's what we have. But a great word that really talks about our past is that of legacy, legacy. Heard a song recently, it's one of the newer songs, and the singer, maybe you've heard it on the radio too, but the singer said, I don't want to leave a destiny. I just want people to see Christ. Well, that's good. That's excellent, isn't it? But the problem is, is that even if we don't want to leave a destiny, guess what we leave? We leave a destiny. We, I'm sorry. Even though we don't want to leave a legacy, guess what we leave? We leave one anyway. Because legacy is defined as something that is passed down from one person to another. When one dies, a situation exists now because of events or actions that took place in the past. And legacy is really how we are remembered, and it provides a path for those who see us and remember us in the future. And so that's the, that's the role that legacy plays in us. How many of you want to leave a good legacy for your grandchildren? for your children. And I think even God even goes a little bit further than that. He talks about leaving a legacy for your children's children's children's. So it's like three generations. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we leave a legacy that will touch our children's children's children and they'll remember us. When I think of legacy, I kind of think of it as our monument to what our lives are. What will people say about us when we pass off the scene? Will they remember us? Will they remember us a lot? Or will they just sweep us under the carpet and not remember anymore? So legacy is extremely important. I'd like, to share, uh, two legacy, I'd like to share the legacies of two men for you. And so the first one is, and both of them are found in Romans 5, 12 through 17. So if you want to turn over there, Romans 5, 12 through 17. And again, this is God's word. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, um, all, all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted there where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even t over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's transgress, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace that came by one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And that free gift is not the result of that one man's sin, for judgment followed one, transgress, one trespass, 
passed through condemnation, but the free gift following many transpasses has justification. So I get a little stumbled because I think of this more in King James. But um, but anyway, uh, there's two men here. One of them was Adam. And what was Adam's legacy? His legacy was sin. His choice, the choice that they made, brought a legacy of sin upon all of us. And, uh, and, and Jesus, on the other hand, came as a perfect Adam. And he died sinlessly, vicariously for us. And his legacy was what? Life. And so, you know, it's very important what we do. And what we're, what we're going to accomplish in 2019 is going to be very, very important. Let's, let's trust that what we do for Christ will be for him and not for ourselves. Uh, what's interesting is, is that do legacy and destiny actually interrelate with each other? And uh, there's an amazing passage, I don't know if you've seen this in the scripture or not, but uh, of an example of where legacy and destiny interact and what happens. And that's found, first of all, in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Let's take a look at a wonderful destiny for Israel, okay? Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, when you rise, and when you rise, you shall bind them on, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets as between your eyes. They shall write them, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so, um, and so, you know, here was a wonderful destiny for Israel. They're sitting there going into the land, a new hope, a new place. It's like going into 2019, right? A new, new place to go to, new time. And, uh, and God said, look it, this is what I want you to do. I want you to share this stuff with your kids because it's going to be something they're going to remember and pass on to their own kids. That's how we're going, that's the, that's the destiny that he had for them was to share everything that God did. But then if you go over to Judges, Judges chapter 2, 6 through 10, uh, you get this account of what happens when they went into the land and if they followed the destiny or not. And so 6 through 10 says, when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land and the people served the Lord with all, through all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who have seen all the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at an age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of, inher in his, of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation were also gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So here was a wonderful destiny that God had passed on. He said, look, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into the land. I want you to inhabit the land. I want you to, to live in the land. I want you to serve me in the land. And then I want you to take all those accounts, and I want you to pass them down to your children. What do you think? Do you think they fulfilled their destiny? No, didn't, they didn't. Because if one generation rose later and there was no account or no knowledge of God and what he had done, I would say they failed. And so that's kind of how sometimes destiny and legacy relate. If our destiny is focused in the right place and we're doing the right things for God, if it's focused on Christ, then sometimes the legacy that results of that will be one that people see our actions, won't they? And they'll, learn, they'll see what we've done and learn how to follow that. Billy Graham says this, the greatest legacy that, that one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things accomplished in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. That's what, that's what Billy Graham said. So as we think of legacy, when we place our hope in the things of this world, the result will often be a legacy of bitterness, 
of hurt and anger that we pass on to our kids and grandkids because they are always watching and listening to what we say and do. Hopefully the legacy we leave demonstrates God's grace. And this is the important part about legacy, is how he walked with us through our struggles in this broken world. So that's, that's what legacy is all about. I don't want to leave a legacy. Yes, we do. Amen? We want to leave a legacy that points our children and their grandchildren and others to Christ and will help them to see him and how we walked as a pattern for them. So we have destiny and we have legacy. And I'm going to keep the words straight here. There's one other aspect I want us to just think about uh, for 2019. And that is today. Today. Today's a great thought. Because today is really all we have is today. It's all we're, and I can't even say we're guaranteed the whole day, but we're here, aren't we? And we're here in this place and in this space right now. Um, what we do today will influence our destiny and our legacy. The choice is ours. Um, when I think of today, I'm actually drawn to one passage that really stands out in my mind each time. It's one I learned when I was in Pioneers. <laughs> I think it's one most people recognize when they think of, of, a, of today, and that is Titus 2, 11 through 14. Titus 2, 11 through 14. Anybody ever memorize that? Okay, a couple hands here. Great passage about today. And so can I read that for you? And let's just, let's just rehearse that one more time, okay? Titus 2, 11 through 14. Here's what God's word says. For the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all unlawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one be, no one disregard you. So just a wonderful passage about today. Some amazing words in there that I'd just like to kind of lift out for a second. One of those amazing words in there is grace. Anybody happy for the grace that Christ has provided on your behalf? I mean, that is really what Christmas is all about. That's what the story in the manger comes down to, is that God provided his grace in the person of Jesus Christ. He came down, right? And, and grace is an amazing thing. It's renewable. It's, it, it offers us space to, to fail. It offers us space to improve. It's always there on our behalf. It's something that's never there. And the amazing part about it is none of us deserved it. None of us. And so that's just what's amazing about grace. And then there's another thing in there, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's kind of like the, the work of today, is, is to deny ourselves, to transform our minds, to think differently, because that's what he wants us to accomplish in our lives today is to change, to be more like him so that we would have a closer walk with him. Um, and then looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. You know, that's one thing we have is a great hope right now. I hope that's your hope, that one day Christ is going to come back. He's going to break the sky, isn't he? He's going to come back on the clouds. He's going to call us all up to be with him forever. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so that's just an amazing part in here. And then the other part, too, is that he gave himself that he might redeem us. You know, he is, this is the amazing part about what Christ has done for us today. Even though we don't necessarily follow him all the time, he's committed to following us and pursuing us all the time. And he's actually working out redemption, our redemption, even when we're not thinking about it. He wants to redeem us, and he's working hard to make that happen. That's why sometimes we wander through some difficult times in this world, you know? That's why sickness, sickness is still here, because it's a sinful world, right? But sometimes we wander in and out of those things, because it's there to, to it's part of his plan to redeem us, to make us more like him. 
And he's committed to that. And by the way, he will accomplish that. Amen? I, I think of that one fellow in the scriptures that he said, you know, today I will, I will build a new, I'll pull down all my barns and build a new barn. And I'll take my ease and drink. Um, he, he had his hope in the wrong place, didn't he? He had his hope on the things of this world. And what did God say? He says, I can't remember what he said. <laughs> he, thou fool, that's it. That's what I was trying to look for. Thou fool, you know, tonight your, your soul will be required of you. So, um, so there's just some amazing things in there. I think the greatest thing that's helped me in today is my daughter gave me a book um, that I've been using for the past year. And, and that book is uh, written by Paul Tripp. I don't know if you guys know Paul Tripp. Paul Tripp is an author. He's a conference speaker. But his main specialty is, is connecting the transforming power of Jesus to everyday life. And so for the past year, I've been reading this thing. I've been getting beat up every day, okay? Because he keeps reminding me, again, that I didn't do this, you know. Oh, I need to do that. And he just keeps reminding me and reminding me and reminding me. and remi That's what we need is to be remi reminded, right, of what God has done on our behalf. But I, I have a passage in here I like to read. It's just a devotional um, that I real quick read the other morning on December the 29th. And, I, and this kind of sums up the work of today. Um, here we go. It says, you're not stuck. You're not encased in concrete. Your life is not a dead end. The possibility of change has not slipped through your fingers. Change is possible for you and me, even in places where it seems most hopeless. Why? Because the giver of transformational grace has made you and me the place where he dwells. If you were to ask me what God is doing, he's working on, the between, on between the already of your justification and the not yet of your sanctification. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? There's two things there. Um, the answer could be given in one word, change. Uh, first, think, first, there is the work of personal growth and change that theologians call progressive sanctification. It is God's lifelong commitment to actually make me what he declared me to be in justification, righteous. In every situation, location, relationship in my life, God is employing people, places, and things as his tools of transformative grace. He is not resting. He does not leave the work of his hands. He takes no breaks. He is relentlessly working to change me into all that his grace makes it possible for me to be. He will not be content for me to be a little bit better. He will work by grace until I'm finally and totally free from sin that is molded into the image of his perfectly righteous son. Change doesn't mean that you'll get your wish list of things that you think will give you the good life. Change doesn't mean that God will turn the people around you into the people you'd like them to be. And change surely doesn't mean that God will exercise his power to make life easier and more pleasurable according to your definition. But you can rest assured that where real change is needed, there is the God of grace who knows just where that change needs to take place and offers everything you need so it can happen. God is just a real blessing to us in ways that we don't even know how he's a blessing to us. You know, it isn't the big movements in our lives that produces the greatest changes. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm waiting for God to reveal himself to me so I can make a great change, that's not going to happen. That's not, that's not where the greatest change is going to take place. Um, it is the numerous small choices and actions that we make every day that produces the greatest change in our lives. It's the little things. It's our commitment to say, Lord, we want to follow you in 2019, and we're going to do that through the struggles and through the hardships and the hurts, but we're going to do it together as a family. Amen? And that's what I love about church, is because church is a community of people that are all going through the same thing, and we can be a big help to each other. What others in our lives need to see today is true faith. They need to see someone who's real. They need to see true hope, hope that's anchored on, vertical, on a vertical relationship with Christ and not on horizontal issues of our world. And, not on, and true love. Well, someone who loves and gives and sacrifices like Christ. If people will see that is in us in 2019, guess what we'll help them with? 
a destiny and their legacy. Amen? And I hope this year that we will be legacy builders for other people because our, our trajectory is good and our actions today are right. So how are we doing? Are we doing okay? Um, are we living daily in God's plan of a future and a hope for us in our own plan? Or you know, are, we, are we actually hoping something at that, in it that's our own plan? This is what I want to do. Uh, are we placing our vertical hope vertically on Christ only or on the horizontal things of this world? Are our lives showing our children and grandchildren that we trust in someone bigger than ourselves and demonstrating how they might find and follow grace, the grace that we found in Christ to walk in this broken world? Just, just some thoughts to think about for 2019. Not a New Year's resolution. Just good old, this is what God's done for us. Amen? And uh, I just pray that, you know, together in 2019, we'll do a wonderful job of serving the Lord. And we'll make a big impact in our town, in our friendships, in our family, as we love him. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, that we can look to your word and find ideas of a future, ideas of a past, and ideas of what to do today. Lord, we thank you that you can use these things to change our lives. We, we thank you, Lord, for your commitment to your unfailing devotion to us who are saved, to redeem us, to forgive us, for the grace that you give. I just pray, Father, that if there's someone here today who's never made a, made a decision to place their trust and faith in Christ, that, Lord, today they might take a look at that, Lord, and consider that in their hearts and move, Father, to, to trust you. Because, Lord, you do have our care in mind. We pray this in your name. Amen.